so we're in Mishnah Torah, um, the laws of idolatry and their statutes, chapter 4, Halakha number 10. And it says, property belonging to people of other cities, which is kept within a city that has been led astray, is not burned, but rather is returned to its owners. So let's just say um, you have uh, a neighboring city and there's relatives or friends of people that live in the city that's uh, been led astray and they're, um, they've agreed to keep a, a watchful eye on some belongings of the people in the other city. If, the, if that city has been judged and it's to be destroyed and all the belongings in it, then before they destroy it, the the officers of the Sanhedrin make sure that all the other people that weren't involved from the other cities get their stuff back, their property. Okay, so this applies even when the, the inhabitants of the city that has been led astray accepted responsibility for it. As implied by Deuteronomy 13, 17, it's goods. For example, it's goods and not those belonging to others. The following rules apply to property belonging to the wicked. For example, those who are swayed to idol worship, which was kept in other cities. If that property was gathered together with the property of the city that has been led astray, they are burned together. If not, it is, it is not destroyed, but rather given to their heirs. And there's, uh, there's a mock locket on this, uh, or a a slight disagreement. It says the Rambam's decision differs from Rashi's interpretation, and this comes from Tractate Sanhedrin of Talmud that lists this, but it's interpreted different from Rambam and Rashi. Um, and it says uh, Rashi points out that where he requires that all property belonging to the condemned city that is found in the neighboring cities to be gathered together and burned with the city that's been led astray. So the Rambam's saying that. People that live in the bad city, if they have property in another city, that that property goes to the heirs or, you know, the, the relatives of the people that, are, that live in the bad city. Uh, but the, the Rashi, Rashi is saying, no, if the city is judged and the people are judged because they're doing idol idolatry, even their belongings there in another city get destroyed too. So everything that's theirs is, is wiped out is what the Rashi is saying. Okay. Halakha 11. If an animal which partially belongs to an inhabitant of a city that has been led astray and partially belongs to a person living in another city is found within the bad city. Is it okay if I use bad city? Okay. <laughs> Okay, so you have two owners here of one animal, and the animal is, is in the city, in the bad city. Okay, it's saying here that it must be destroyed. Okay, so let's just say um, I live in the bad city for, you know, just for an explanation. I live in the bad city. Catherine lives in the good city. We both own this, uh, this ox, and we share it for plowing. Okay, well... The bad city is judged, the animal's in the city where I'm at in the bad city, so it has to be destroyed. Okay, well, um, the question would be, well, why can't it just go to the other city with the other owner? And the answer here is because that animal is killed because its life is dependent on the portion which belongs to the inhabitant of the bad city. So it is therefore considered as if it belongs to him entirely, because where the animal is, with the particular person taking care of it, he, uh, he, he's putting forth all the effort to maintain the animal and make sure it stays alive. So in that case, it falls along with all the other animals that are to be destroyed. Okay, in contrast, a loaf of bread which is owned by such partners is permitted because it can be divided. So that brings a little light to it also. Uh, you can divide a loaf of bread, you can't divide uh, you can't divide an ox. Not one that's used, you know, for, uh, for plowing or whatever. And of course, you know, any type of creatures that are offered to idols, even if, even if they are a kosher creature, it's forbidden to use that for food. Uh, it can't be kosher food. 
Okay. Let me make sure I'm not missing anything here. Halakha 12. It is forbidden to benefit from an animal which belongs to an inhabitant of a bad city or a city that's been led astray and which it was slaughtered just as it is forbidden to derive benefit from an ox which was condemned to be stoned and was slaughtered. So just like we, we just mentioned this, it's just like the ox that gored someone and has to be stoned to death, uh, you, can't, uh, you can't eat the meat. We are permitted to benefit from the hair of both men and women of the condemned city. Why? <laughs> Why hair, right? And we're going to, yeah, we're going to get to that. <laughs> so we are permitted to benefit from the hair of both men and women of the condemned city. A wig, however, is considered part of its goods and is therefore forbidden. So what would, you, what would we use hair for, right? Okay. It says here that it's not uh, proper to, to make a wig. Um, it says, uh, See Hill Coat Avail 1421, which states that it is forbidden to benefit from a corpse, but that, but that the prohibition does not involve its hair. Sometimes farmers will use hair to spread it around the garden to keep certain animals out. That's, yeah. So, yeah, uh, Ross mentioned here that sometimes farmers will use hair to put around um, a perimeter of a field or a garden to keep pests or, you know, destroying animals out like deer and things like that. So deriving benefit, we're talking about deriving benefit from the hair. Okay. It's kind of an odd thing, huh? It, it's, not, it's not modern. <laughs> there's been major, yeah, there's been uh, events that have occurred in the last 100 years uh, with with things like that that uh, make it kind of taboo in our modern society to use human hair for things. Of, uh, of course, except for wigs. It's pretty popular in some groups to wear wigs or, uh, you know, some people, uh, um, they um, do hair extensions and things of that nature with real human hair. But they, they donate from their Okay. Yeah, a lot of people yeah. sell their hair, yeah, while they're living, yes. <laughs> okay, we'll move on from that. <laughs> Enough about the hair. I don't think I'm going to have that problem. <laughs> okay, number thir uh, Holocaust 13. Produce, produce, excuse me, produce, which is connected to its source of nurture, is permitted, as implied by Deuteronomy 13, 17. Gather all its goods, burn, uh, and burn them. This includes only those articles which must merely be gathered and burned. Thus excludes produce, which is still connected to its source of nurture, and would have to be severed and gathered in order to be burned. Uh, the same principle applies to the in, to the inhabitants' hair. Needless to say, the the trees themselves are permitted, and are bequeathed to the heirs. The following rules apply to the consecrated property within it. Those animals which were consecrated to be sacrificed on the altar themselves must die. Excuse me, since the sacrifices of the wicked are an abomination, and that's a direct quote from Proverbs twenty one twenty seven. Property which is consecrated for the purposes of the temple must be redeemed and afterwards is burned. As implied by the word, it's goods, it's goods and not those which are consecrated. Okay, 43. So, um, so the trees, it says the trees themselves, like fruit trees, they're permitted uh, to be, the fruit can be, um, used by the heirs. Of course, they're not, it's not going to be used by the inhabitants of the bad city because they're going to be put to death. The people, not the trees. So, um, even though the city and all the other belongings that can be gathered would be burned, uh, the trees themselves and fruit or vegetables that are attached to plants that are being nurtured by the plant will not be destroyed. Um, okay. 
So the trees, uh, when it says here that it goes to the heirs, it says that the trees are not considered ownerless. Um, and so they're not free to be acquired by anyone, by just anyone. Um, they have to be acquired by the heirs. So they have owners, but the ownership is being transferred to the heirs because, of course, the people in a bad city are going to be put down. And again, this is specific to the land of Israel and these people, you know, uh, that's a tribal nation. So there's lots of heirs. Okay. Halakha 14, the following rules apply to firstborn animals and the animal tithes that are found within the bad city. Those that are unblemished are considered to be animals consecrated to be uh, sacrificed on the altar and must die. Those that are blemished are considered to be uh, its animals, or its animals means animals that belong to the city that would be used by the people. Um, and they are slain with the consecrated animals as well. Okay, the following rules apply to Truma. Um, for those of us that may not be familiar with the term Truma, this is um, like the uh, Hala dough that we, um, the Jewish ladies burn today uh, when they prepare for Shabbat. Um, of course, there's all kinds of laws surrounding that, but there's specific laws about pulling a piece of the hala out and burning it. Um, it represents the true ma, which is gifts that are given to the Kohanim, the sons of Aaron, um, for their food. And it's, um, it's consecrated, it's holy. Uh, it's a direct commandment for Israelite people to give the true ma to the priesthood, to the Kohanim. So the following rules apply to true ma, which is contained within the city. If it, if it has already been given to a priest, it should be allowed to rot because it is considered his private property. If it is still in the possession of an Israelite, it should be given to a priest in another city because it is considered to be the property of heaven and its consecrated nature extends to its actual substance. So it's not to be destroyed with uh, all the other things in the city because it's designated for a specific purpose which makes it the property of heaven. So anything labeled as truma, uh, which would include um, a person's tithes or anything uh, like the half shekel that's commanded by Hashem to give uh, uh, when, when people come up for the, um, the festival of ingathering and such, all that is considered truma. It's a property of heaven. It's not just a mundane piece of property. So it, even though it's in a bad place, it still maintains that specific, uh, uh, what do we call it, purpose. Thank you. All right, uh, Halakha 15, the second tithe. Uh, the Torah talks about the second tithe, which, is, which uh, goes into detail about the time of Sukkot, where people would, uh, if they lived too far away, uh, to bring the second tithe, they'd sell it off uh, for silver or gold coins, and then they would show up for Sukkot and buy everything that they needed to celebrate Sukkot uh, in Jerusalem. So the second tithe money used to redeem the second tithe and the sacred writings in it must be entombed. Okay, um, has everyone heard of a Geniza? Okay, um, you have... Again, the, the second tithe is holy, and uh, any type of writings that are used uh, that have the name of Hashem written on them are considered holy. Um, when they become unusable, uh, and we've got to think about the second tithe here, it's not just money, it's usually goods. So it's saying here, the, the second tithe itself, or the money used to redeem the second tithe, is considered holy. And any sacred writings in it uh, that are holy with the sacred writings that have the name of Hashem, they have to be put in a geniza, which is like a grave for sacred objects. So like uh, zitzit, everybody familiar with the four tassels that Jewish people wear? Um, the zitzit themselves, if they're uh, considered unfit to be used, the loop on them is cut, front, uh, cut in half and it's removed from the garment. Um, any, any sacred books like uh, a Tanakh or a Torah scroll 
a mezuzah that goes on a do doorpost, any of those things that are worn out and they're not useful anymore, they're not just tossed away or burned or trashed. They actually go in a geniza, which is a special tomb for holy things. Yes, because the tefillin contains, the question was, does that include tefillin? And yes, because the tefillin contains a parchment that has the name of Hashem. And among other reasons as well. It's a very holy item. Okay. Uh, Halakha 16. Anyone who administers the judgment of a city that has been led astray is considered as if he offered a burnt offering consumed entirely by fire, as Deuteronomy 13, 17 states, entirely for the sake of God uh, your Lord. Furthermore, such actions... Such action diverts divine wrath from the Jews as the following verse continues so that God's fierce anger will be allayed and it brings them blessing and mercy as the verse states and he will grant you mercy he will deal mercifully with you and will make you flourish now this is something to stop on right here okay so the person um, let, let me back up a little bit. Uh, there's only one group of people that's allowed to make this kind of judgment. Um, there are two types of courts in the land of Israel whenever uh, everything's in order. There's the Great Sanhedrin, and every city has a lesser Sanhedrin. The Great Sanhedrin has 70 elders and the main judge. It's a group of 71. Um, all the cities have a group of 23 judges. Um, the 71 is called the Great Sanhedrin. And only they have the authority to make these judgments. So what they're talking about here is the high, uh, the, the high judge, the Nasi is what he's called, the leader of the Sanhedrin. For him to make this ruling, it's, a, it's like he is making a fire offering to Hashem. And it, if you think about it for a second, you know, comparing an animal to a group of people seems like it would not be equal. Um, how is it that uh, killing an entire city full of people and burning the city is like making an offering? Well, it, it gives a brief explanation of here because it's entirely for the sake of God, for the, for the sake of Hashem. This is um, belaying the wrath of Hashem from coming upon the whole nation. So um, this is like, uh, what, what, does anybody know what it's called when a person dies for the sake of heaven? A Kiddush Hashem, like Nadav and Abihu, everybody knows about Nadav and Abihu, they died doing something holy, even though they kind of, it wasn't the right time to do it, but it, nonetheless it was a holy act, and they, they lost their lives for it. It's called a Kiddush Hashem. So what this judge is doing here is decreeing, he's decreeing something that was commanded by Hashem for the sake of Hashem, so the wrath of Hashem doesn't come down on the whole nation because the, the Israelite people are not considered individuals. It's considered all for one, one for all. So when the nation is judged as righteous, everybody is looked at as righteous. When the nation is judged as wicked, everybody's looked at as wicked and the incurring judgment comes upon all the people. Um, so this is a really big deal here because for this to be allowed to continue in the land of Israel with a city and a group of people choosing to be idolatrous, the wrath, w without this event taking place, the wrath would come upon the whole nation. So it's a very destructive thing to, to have so many people put to death, but for the sake of Hashem's holiness, the sake of the holiness of the land and for the mercy of Hashem over the whole nation, it's absolutely necessary. It's considered that he's dealing merciful with the whole nation, is what it says here. And he will grant you mercy, he will deal mercifully with you, and will make you flourish. Has, has it ever been done? There's a mock there's locate on that, or um, uh, a, a dispute or a discussion. Um, the Rambam says yes, that it has been done, because there's uh, 
a, a place, there's places in the Tanakh where uh, prophets have said that they've beheld this destruction on a city with their own eyes. And then um, there, are other, there are other sages that maintain that it, it never happened, that this was uh, put into the Torah for uh, discussion purposes to keep cities from going astray. So some say it hasn't happened, some say it has. Some even say that there's never been an execution from the high court. And uh, the, the Talmud teaches us that a Sanhedrin that has one execution in 70 years is considered a bloody Sanhedrin. So, um, it's not, if it has ever happened, it hasn't happened often. Just like the, uh, along with the executions, it's something that hasn't happened often, if it ever has. Okay, um, we're at a good place to stop here. On ch uh, we'll be going into chapter 5 at the next class. So if there's any comments or questions, um, let's get them out on the table.